Welcome to the Simpleton Podcast. I have as a guest Dr. Larry Chap. He was a he had a career as a theology professor at DeSales University, and now he is an author and founder of a Catholic Worker Farm. And you, your blog is Gaudium et Spes 22. Gaudium et Spes 22.com. Yes, it's a mouthful. It refers to the Vatican II document, Gaudium et Spes, and Section 22. I looked that up right before we talked. I thought that was interesting. Um, well, it's a key. It's a key key part of the council, and we can talk about that. Laura is the co-host of this podcast, and I think you might know her younger brother, Fernando Cartagena. I certainly do. I had Fernando as a student. I think I may have even had his wife Casey uh, as a student, but, but I'm not certain. But I certainly know them both. They are lovely people, wonderful people. They've been to the farm. Um, I love Fernando to the moon and back. He's just a great guy. So Laura wanted me to tell you that her and Fernando are going to come visit you. She wants to meet you. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, we have visitors on the farm all the time, and we, we love it. The, the kids love the sheep and the lambs and all that. Well, that's kind of where I wanted to start was um, I wanted to hear your vision for a Catholic worker farm. I've, I've had some experience with a Catholic worker. You know, I've, I've lived at a Catholic worker, simple house. In some ways, people understand it as like an iteration of the Catholic worker. Um, yeah. Why did you choose a Catholic worker model for your, I guess it's a ministry. Is that the right way to say it? Like you decide you wanted to found a ministry and you decide it would be a Catholic worker? Yeah, it's, it's sort of long and complicated, so I'll try to give you the short version. In my 20 years as a professor of theology, uh, one of the things that really concerned me was uh, our culture. And so a lot of my theological teaching revolved around a critique of modern American culture, deconstructing it for the students in order to flip the script that is in their brain that modernity gives them in order, therefore, then to be open to the truths of the Catholic faith. And the more and more that I, I dove into that, the more and more, I kept turning to the writings of Dorothy Day and Peter Moore and the co-founders of the Catholic Worker Movement. And I began to realize, as did my wife, who was going through the same process independently of me, that I really liked their vision and that their vision seemed to me to be spot on. And then uh, the co-owner of our farm was a former student of mine that Fernando also knows, uh, Father John Gribowich. And Father John was very involved. He's a priest of the Diocese of Brooklyn. He was very involved in the Catholic worker movement in New York. And, uh, and we all sort of independently sort of converged, and we saw it as a sign of the Holy Spirit in our lives, uh, that we, we really wanted to embrace the Catholic worker vision because we, we saw in it the best critique, not only of modernity, but also in some ways, the proposal that they have is the best sort of prescription for how the church needs to move forward as it confronts modern culture. And so one day we were just sitting in our house and uh, Father John said, hey, you know, uh, we've all been drawn to this idea of starting a Catholic worker farm, so why don't we just do it? And I was growing increasingly dissatisfied with higher education and teaching and, and all that. So I jumped at the chance and I said, yes, uh, at age 52 or three or whatever it was, I'm ready for a new adventure. I'm ready for something more radical, more demanding of, of me. Uh, I mean, after all, the life of a professor and all the professors listening, I don't care if you object. The life of a professor is very cushy and very comfortable and very sweet. And it was not easy to leave behind in terms of lifestyle, but I'm glad I did. I, I want to talk about Catholic Worker more, but something else you said made me wonder. So when I look at your blog, it seems to me that your audience is Catholics. Yeah. Oh, right? yeah. You're not speaking so much to the world or evangelizing. You're, I would almost say you're pastoring. Yeah, I, I think that's an accurate description of what I'm doing. So although, when you have, although I, I hope it's not just limited to Catholics in some sense, I do have readers of the blog who aren't Catholic, but who are simply spiritual seekers or Christians of a different kind who are at least open to Catholicism. So when you say that you are, in a sense, correcting something in the student's mind or maybe the reader's mind now about like their orientation towards modernity what is that major theme that you're trying to correct because it seems like you're not reaching out to modernity to change it you're taking the catholics who grew up in it and somehow changing their orientation towards it yes what i'm trying to to correct in a sense is this notion that uh 
the, the view of reality that our culture presents to us is simply one view among many that is possible. In other words, one of the functions of culture is that it creates what the sociologist Peter Berger calls the plausibility structures in our mind about what constitutes the real or what uh, Charles Taylor in his book, uh, A Secular Age, calls our social imaginary. In other words, culture creates, in a sense, our sense of reality. Here's what's real, here's what's not. And what I tried to, tried to get my students to see which is that there are several aspects of our social imaginary which emphasize to us that only what Charles Taylor calls the imminent frame or the horizontal world or the world of everydayness, only that world is really real truly real, that supernatural things, spiritual things, they might exist, they might not exist, but they're not part of the warp and woof of our daily life. They don't, they don't, in a sense, construct us from within. They might be sort of add-ons to who we are, as my friend Bill Portier calls the sort of Jesus sprinkles on the ice cream of our culture. Uh, and thus we live our, our faith rather superficially. We give notional assent to the truths of Catholicism, even while in Internally, we are we are pretty much just denizens of bourgeois modern American suburban culture and the values that it espouses, in particular, this notion that the penultimate realities of material well-being really are the ultimate points of existence and that we need to orient our lives around material well-being and the comfort that bourgeois middle-class sort of existence gives us. That's, that's in a sense from, this is Dorothy Day and Peter Morin relying on people like Berdayev and others who pointed out that the bourgeois has always been with us, but now modernity has elevated this notion and the bourgeois defined as the pursuit of material well-being and comfort as in a sense, the ultimate aim of life. Modernity has elevated this to a religion. It's elevated it to ultimate status, which is an idolatry, which is an idolatry. And it really, it really nullifies the reality of God. It's, it's worse than atheism. It represents, as I said in one of my blogs, the nullification of God in our culture. The idea that even if God exists, God doesn't matter. So how would this be different than like a Roman who was just greedy? Like what, what is it about the way we're living in modernity that's focused on material comfort that's different than greed throughout the whole history of humanity. Well, in some ways it's not. Greed is greed and greed has always been with us. And uh, as Berdyaev said, just like the, the sort of middle class uh, obsession with cultural com with material comfort has always been with us. The difference would be, once again, in the social imaginary. An ancient Roman rich man is still living within the social imaginary or the imminent frame of the Roman pagan religious sense of, of what constitutes reality, what St. Paul called the principalities and powers that govern uh, the air, the sky, the earth, and so on. And that rich Roman would still have thought in those categories, and so did almost every single denizen of the Roman citizen think in those categories. And thus, when Christianity came along and, in a sense, flipped the script of the Roman uh, social imaginary by, in a sense, killing the gods, killing those principalities and powers. It was then able to confront the greed, Roman greed of the typical Roman variety, and say, now you need to rethink this. You need to rethink your greed in the light of the new definition of the real that Christianity brings with it. And it had powerful effect. Um, whereas today, all right, the church doesn't, doesn't really doesn't really have that advantage of confronting the greed of our society from within a common ideological framework that it shares with the rich. The rich occupy a world completely different, a different mindset than, than what the church represents. You've thought about this far more than I have, but I wanted to throw this out there. So this reminds me of this anecdote I once heard about like Kierkegaard, that like his, when his father raised him, his father would show him flashcards of historical figures and there'd be like Abraham Lincoln or some, you know, Napoleon or whoever it was. And then there'd be Moses would be like the next flashcard because he was like kind of showing that sacred history and real history are history, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, and yeah, just absolutely. the fact that that's a little bit shocking is funny. 
you know? Well, yeah. And, and we, we find it shocking and it, it really, I love Kierkegaard. He has limitations of course, but I love him because this is, this is exactly my point which is that to a modern person, and this is what defines modernity and the, the sort of the cult of the bourgeois in our society, is, is that you can believe in God, but salvation history is not real history. And God is not part of our social fabric. We have freedom of religion, but, you know, we have freedom to eat fruitcake, too. Uh, and, and it's pretty much pretty much on that level. Uh, whether you have a, a Whopper at Burger King or a Big Mac or worship Jesus, it's all the same thing. It's all from the realm of subjective choosing, subjective choice. Uh, and on that level, and in that sense, it's not considered what I, really real to us. It's not part of history. It's not part of the fabric of existence. It's an add-on. So with the Catholic worker, the choice to found one of those is, in my experience with the Catholic worker, one of the great things about it is it's freedom. Like it's almost anarchistic freedom of like anyone can elect to found one and then you yeah. kind of embody however you want to embody the vision, right? And that's also the weirdness of it is that you come upon Catholic workers where women are kind of concelebrating the mass or all these weird things are happening at a Catholic worker gathering, you know? Yeah. And... um. In my experience of Catholic workers, there was always something political. And when you read the aims and means of the Catholic worker, there's almost always some political part of a Catholic worker, like pacifism or um, is you, pacifism is probably usually it, you know, the, the, well, pacifism. And I would say Dorothy Day's along with that, her critique of militarism, the military industrial complex, but also her critique of capitalism. Um, she was. She was in favor of free markets, but we, we have conflated the notion of free market with capitalism as we now have it. And some would argue, for example, that maybe the capitalism that we now have really is not a free market form of economics. But we, I mean, I'm not an economist and I don't want to speak, speak to that. Right. But what, I what I would say, I want to go back to what you said at the beginning. Yes, I have to be careful. I've, I've gotten to some trouble with some of my fellow Catholic workers when I uh, rant and rave about some of the distortions in terms of Catholic identity that have crept into the Catholic worker movement. There's a lot more sap in the tree, Catholic sap in the Catholic worker tree than I have previously been willing to acknowledge. Uh, there's a lot of good stuff going on out there. Uh, nevertheless, I run into this all the time where people are confused by the fact that I'm both a strong devotee of Dorothy Day and Peter Morin, as well as a very orthodox Catholic. And what I remind people is that Dorothy and Peter were very orthodox Catholics. Dorothy Day and Peter Morn, for example, accepted the whole church's sexual teaching, teaching on gender and all that stuff. Um, all the while, though, offering this trenchant critique of capitalism and, and, and modernity. Uh, and so, yeah, the freedom of the Catholic work is, movement is its strength, but it's also its, its weakness. I mean, anybody can start a Catholic worker farm and call it a Catholic worker farm. I once got a humorous email from a woman who said, I'd like to start a Catholic worker farm. To where do I submit my form and my request? What sort of central authority right. do I have to get vetted by in order to be called? A I wrote her back and I said, you can call yourself a Catholic worker farm and raise earthworms. I, you know, it, do it doesn't really matter. Um, in, in the sense of doing whatever you want to do. But I would say that all that being said, one of the, one of the common, there are common denominators, and one of the common denominators of a Catholic worker farm is, is, is going to be this emphasis on a kind of um, back to natural things, not just back to the land, but a re-emphasis upon the rhythms of nature, getting back to the natural prayer rhythm, we're Benedictine oblates, we pray the liturgy, the hours. So it's, it's part of an overall spirituality, very Benedictine in its core, uh, in, in, in seeing this sort of back, and, and the teaching, as Peter Morin said, of certain lost skills, what he call artisanal skills. So like my wife, we, we raise sheep. My wife uh, processes their wool, teaches people how to spin it into yarn. We, you know, we can vegetables, uh, you know, and, and we, we raise chickens and so forth. So we, we, we teach people when they come to the farm how to, how to do certain artisanal skills. And Peter Morin was always adamant that this is central to a Catholic worker farm because what people have lost in the mechanized digital world of modernity is, are the tactile 
skills that actually bring their own sense of fulfillment. You know, when, when you act, you can go to the store and buy a wool sweater, but when you actually start with a sheep, share it, process its wool, spin it into yard and then knit yourself a sweater, that's an entirely different, that's an entirely different process. And uh, so that, that's what kind of what a Catholic worker farm in terms of common denominator is, but the, also there's a commitment to social justice and, not all Catholic workers are out there on the front lines getting arrested, protesting this, that, and the other thing. And I applaud our good friend, uh, Martha Hennessy, uh, who is Dorothy Day's granddaughter, got arrested because she broke into, she was one of the seven plowshares, seven that broke into a nuclear submarine thing. I think it was in North Carolina. Uh, and, you know, got arrested because they they defaced a few things. Uh, yeah, it's amazing how far they got. Like, I feel like everyone would assume we have better security on our nuclear stuff than the plowshares yeah. movement has proven we do, you know? Oh, well, yeah, that was kind of the, sh I said the same thing to my wife. I was like, my goodness, the one thing they proved is that I don't think we can trust the security of our, of our nuclear facilities necessarily. It, it, did they have to call the police on themselves? Like, did they even have to alert the security that they were... That's a good sub. question. I, I don't know the de I don't know the details of their arrest, whether they self self turn them, you know, turn themselves in or, you know, whether they were found out somehow or whatever. But the point is, is that there's there is that social justice element of the Catholic worker movement. And uh, I mean, it goes all the way back to Dorothy Day's labor agi agitation in the 1930s. Part of the whole a lot of modern people don't understand how controversial, for example, something as simple as a labor union was in, in, in the 20s. It was seen as communist. It was seen as Marxist. Uh, it was seen as anti-capitalist, anti-American. Uh, and to the great credit of the Catholic Church, the Catholic Church was on the front lines in the United States of fighting for labor unions and workers' rights to a great extent because the church at that time was an immigrant church with, with a lot of, you know, Irish and Italian immigrants and so on working in factories uh, in unsafe conditions for minimal amounts of money. Uh, and, and so the labor union movement was something Dorothy pushed. Uh, and, and it's just continued on since then, of course, her anti-war activism. Uh, that went into the 60s and, and 70s as well. So I have a hypothesis that I think you're the right person to comment on. And it's that like since the 80s, I feel like there's been this like painful thing that Christians are kind of coming to terms with that's like, Christianity is not in the public square at all. It, you can't make arguments for public policy based on the Ten Commandments or the Bible or anything like that, right? Right. And for a lot of American history, it was, right? There were at least enough voters yeah. that that was a meaningful way of like presenting your arguments, right? And in a sense, I feel like we're kind of gone from Constantine to the 1980s of having Christianity have a role in shaping government, uh, you know, like kind of a top-down shaping of culture, you know? Yeah. And yeah. now more and more, we're just like, okay, we are a minority uh, much more like the early church. And the silver lining on this, in my mind, is that when Christ is operating and the whole New Testament's written, it's all being written as a minority culture within a larger culture, right? right. In fact, exactly. they're, not, they're not even like dealing with the problem of how you run a Christian nation, right? No, which is so, why you, I don't want to interrupt you, which is yeah. why you get St. Paul essentially saying, just obey the authorities. <laughs> you know? Right. Yeah, but, but then it also God, makes... Just move on. Everything we do to kind of like, it, it seems like Christ should have some say, like when you have a nation of Christians, how it's run, you know? So, but that whole project is like this, like secondary layer over the gospel in a way, right? Like it's all like, it's not direct. Right. You know? Right. And I feel like in a way you, it feels like as we become a minority again, or have already become a minority again, it feels like we're in our more natural position. Like our position that maybe like the great evangelization happened in, in the early church. Okay. Okay. You have, th you have three hours because <laughs> uh, this is, this, this is the question of the day. I mean, this is such an excellent question. It's a question that I get asked all the time and I blog a lot about. Uh, we're, we're talking about the issue of the relationship between church and state. The, the question of what we call confessional states, should the government officially profess Catholicism and, and so on uh, as, as in the days of Constantine. Can, can and, I pause and, right there, though? Sure. The question of whether or not it should is kind of a weird question because it just isn't. 
Well, yeah, and that's the point that I was just about to make is that I find a lot of these conversations to be simply pointless, uh, even arcane, because we're living, we're dwelling in fantasy camp land. If, if we're, I mean, you run into all these radical traditionalists these days who are critical of Vatican II and the modern church because it refuses to acknowledge the legitimacy of a Catholic state. And I was like, what fantasy Disney World version of modern culture are you sort of living in if you think that there is even a remote hope of such a thing happening in our time? I would further go on and say, not only is there remote hope of that, that even though I acknowledge in theory, because we're talking about prudential practical judgments here, in theory, there might be some hypothetical state out there someday where 99% of the people in the country are Catholics, where we say, okay, Catholicism becomes the established religion of the land. I'm not going to foreclose on that, but the, de the deal is this. If you look into history and you examine all of the various ways in which there was a strong confluence of church and state, a union of throne and altar, those things almost always came back to bite the church in the rear. I mean, look at France with the French Revolution, uh, which was in many ways simply an anti-clerical backlash. Look at modern Ireland, modern Spain. You look around the world, everywhere and in certain places in Latin America where now Pentecostal Protestantism is taking over, wherever there were these strong alliances between church and state and Catholicism was sort of coercively imposed from the top down. That's a bit of a caricature, but there was that ethos of a sort of top down thing. Catholicism did not root deeply evangelically in the hearts of people. It simply became a kind of cultural phenomenon. And therefore, when culture changed to take on the patina of sort of modern Western consumers, bourgeois values, then the whole thing collapses. And, and in so doing, then there's a backlash against the church saying, you and you clericalist jerks, you're the ones who have held us back all these years. I'm running off to the Pentecostal church or I'm running off to become secular. So my point would be that even if you look into the history of the church, you see that these sorts of arrangements were rarely beneficial for the church. Uh, now let's go back to St. Augustine in his famous book, The City of God. It's to be remembered that St. Augustine lived post-Constantine at a time when the Roman Empire was sort of falling apart. And a lot of Christians were saying, oh, woe is us. What are we going to do now, now that Rome is disintegrating? And Augustine wrote the city of God in part in contrast to that. And what's interesting about the city of God is that Augustine does not give us in any way, shape or form a, a detailed accounting of the state, a theory of the state, nor does he give us an accounting of the theory of the relation between church and state. Instead, what Augustine gives us is a performative accounting of history as as a praxis and says, History breaks down into two categories, the city of God and the city of man. The city of God is characterized by those who are oriented towards the love of God and all that that implies. The city of man is oriented towards what Augustine called the libido dominandi, or the desire to dominate, to possess, to acquire. And he saw those two forces as the engine that drove history. And though, and that, that, battle between the Amor Dei and the libido dominandi cuts right through the heart of every human being. And you find it even in the church as well as in the state. So Augustine, what he does instead of giving us a theory of church and state, what he gives us in his performative account of history, what he gives us is, is a church whose chief function is therefore to identify and to oppose idolatries, the idolatries of the libido dominandi. In other words, a prophetic church, a counter witness church, a church that lives holiness, a church that lives Christ, and as such is the leaven in society that society actually needs. And I, this is what drew me to the Catholic worker movement. It struck me as very Augustinian in this sense, that what the church needs to be doing today, instead of worrying about confessional states, instead of worrying about all of this, what the church needs, and it goes to your point about us being a minority. The church needs to set itself up as that which opposes idolatry, both in the church and out of the church. And, and therefore, those of us who are in the business, if you will, of trying to push the universal call to holiness of Dorothy Day and Vatican II, and those of us who are trying to set up a counter witness, kind of think Rod Dreher here, Benedict Option, all this kind of stuff. All right. That's the future of the church. And which is, this is why we started a Catholic worker farm. The future of the church is prophetic counter witness, the setting up of communities. Go ahead. So I'm going to ask you to defend 
the idea of counter witness in a sense. And what I mean by that is, um, like there's a, there's a, there's an idea here that we, that shaping society is our goal. Right. And one of the things that attracted right. me to the Catholic worker is kind of the first part, which is the radical personalism that like the poor eating at our table, showering in our showers, this like really great yes. solidarity with the poor. And I'm meeting some people who have converted to Catholicism recently. And I feel like they convert away from nihilism. I call them the recovering yes. nihilists. Right. Absolutely. Um, and what they feel like Christ is, is that which teaches them how to put one foot in front of the other. Right. Not so yeah, much how it. to change society, but how to be, you know, personalism fits well with this idea. Right. And when I meet Catholics who are, we get very, inter it's kind of like, this is true of secular society too. Like you always want to debate federal politics or UN level politics, whereas really state level, city level neighborhood association might have more impact on your life and you might have more yeah. power to change it. Right. Um, yeah. And like, whenever I hear someone want to talk about distributivism, it's like, it's a, it's a nice concept, you know, but it's like, at the end of the day, it's like, how many people are you willing to kill to implement this idea? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I let's like take that. this That's... out of utopian and into like yeah. nails and tacks here, you know? And so like, is Christ, like, like how much of this is really the proper, how much of this is maybe a waste of time when we're just sitting here talking about how to shape society and be the counter witness when maybe the real role is how to put your foot in front of your other on the way, you know? Oh yeah. My friend, Dr. Rodney Hauser, my former colleague at the sales, who Fernando also knows, uh, and Casey, uh, likes always to say, you have to teach people to walk before they can run. And, and when we talk about establishing counter witness, we're not talking here about becoming latter day of scenes where we run off to our compounds with our buried school buses and our hand grenades embossed with Our Lady of Fatima, all set up with, you know, we're the, we're the, we're the righteous ones, we're the pure waiting for judgment upon all those others. That's a mischaracterization. It is, it is a form of rigorism and purism that is not at all what Dorothy Day was, was about. Um, whatever counter witness you're setting up, of course, has to take into account the gradations of where of where people are. And and it could be just something as simple as, as advocating for people to lead more spiritual lives, to live simpler lives materially and so on. Uh, and in other words, it doesn't have to be something grandiose or spectacular. You don't have to take some big righteous stand against, you know, stick it to the man and all that kind of stuff. It does. It, most people are not capable of that. Most people are trying to raise kids and have a family and they don't, they, they, they can't, it's really, and in some sense, wrong of them to run out into the streets and get arrested protesting something while their five kids are at home going, how come daddy's in jail? Uh, now, maybe there's also pedagogical value in that. Well, daddy's in jail because he was protesting nuclear weapons. Okay, fine. But that, that, that's, a, that's something most people are just not going to do. And that's why Peter Morin always said, Peter Morin was not, a, we're not talking revolution here, other than a revolution of the heart, as Peter Morin called it. And Morin always said, no revolution. What we need to do is to build, build a new world within the shell of the old. And, and, and acting as a kind of leaven in our own little way throughout society. And it also means not having an us versus them mentality to Did, realize. Go ahead. Does Morin have writings beyond the easy essays? Not many. No, okay. and most but, of the stuff is in his easy essays. Morin was I, not really a prolific writer. Essays. Anybody listening recommend the easy essays of Peter Morin. They're very profound. Um, like two ways to have this counter witness that are extreme ways. I feel like Catholics are only now just coming, waking up to the fact they need to have the counter witness, you know, but like one way is like the Amish way, right? Where it is like, yeah, you know, sure. and the other way I think of as in Judaism, there's the modern Orthodox movement, which it's like, take all the teachings to Judaism as absolutely seriously as you can and be as in society as you can at the same time, you know? Exactly. <laughs> to engage the world. Right. So the way forward for Catholics is much more like the Jewish modern Orthodox movement. Is that your opinion? Well, in, in, yeah, minus the funny hats, perhaps. Right. Uh, and I don't mean and I don't mean that anti-Semitically. I just mean that we don't want to become sort of, I don't know, 
characters in, in a sense uh and 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 to be so, so wedded to a particular cultural expression that's what i'm trying to say a particular cultural expression of our religion which then becomes identified that's what it means to be a catholic um uh, what 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 i would say is you know we we can all do sort of simple things uh it doesn't like i said it doesn't be anything grandiose for example i always tell people if you want to really do a counter witness throw away your stupid television set don't have a television in your home well you know go ahead larry that that was a relevant statement 20 years ago now the television is irrelevant well, I was just about to say, yeah. to, add on, to add on to that, okay, so we're cord cutters. We got rid of cable. We got rid of our television. And part of that was be, wasn't was just as a protest against television. It was, in some sense, an acknowledgement of television's irrelevance uh, because we noticed that we were simply streaming more and more things right. on, our, on our computer devices. So I was going to say, throw away your television set, but also don't subscribe to Netflix. Don't subscribe to Hulu. Don't subscribe to YouTube TV. Don't subscribe to Amazon Prime because th those, those uh, venues are larded with all kinds of evils. And I don't mean that in some sort of puritanical, oh, there's, all, there's too many, too, too many sex bits and those things. Oh, for the sex bits are the, are the least of it. And, 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 and it's, it, it, it goes far deeper than that. Um, it, it's the inculcation of a certain mindset, a certain digital fixation that we have. So I was going to say, you need to teach your children a certain asceticism of the digital. You can't, I don't think in today's world, just to tell your children, throw away your phones, throw away your computers that they have to live in the world. And it's part I, of engaging the world. I but thought, like, during the 90s, I thought the TV show Friends did me more damage than any other media, you know, because it's like showing right. this like lifestyle that has no consequence. No one's ever getting depressed. No one's ever feeling the nihilism or something like that, although they're living it joyfully, you know, and that to me was the ultimate unrealistic portrayal, you know. I'm older than you, so m my version of Friends was Seinfeld. And uh, although I will say this, at least on Seinfeld, the characters were not presented as uh, people to emulate. <laughs> right, they right. were presented as losers to a, to a great extent. I mean, uh, and so their foibles, I mean, once again, these are four secular people living secular lives, sexually open lives and unconcerned with God and religion. But they were presented precisely as very superficial people and the, the last episode sort of they ended up in jail because of the, all of their superficialities that were exposed uh so i at least give seinfeld that but nevertheless it 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 does still that show still inculcated this sense of here's what's real right notice something here this goes all the way back this is an interesting point and, and maybe we're meandering a bit but it's something i've been talking about for a long time it goes to this concept then of the social imaginary the plausibility structures that the media create for us in our culture you go all the way back to the early days say well early days for me like the early 1960s with the, the great rise of the of situation comedies in particular uh in the united states Show me one situation comedy, beginning with, say, the Dick Van Dyke show, Andy Gr on forward, where religion was a central part of the lives of the families that were portrayed there. You might occasionally see them heading off to church, but there, and, and, and obviously studio executives had made the decision that religion is divisive and you might lose half your audience if you portray sort of strongly Catholic characters or strongly Jewish characters or strongly Protestant characters. So you eliminate religion for marketing reasons. But that had an effect. Once again, the nullification of God, the nullification of divine things, and the elevation of a certain kind of bourgeois existence is what the really real is. Look at these TV families. This is the real. So I want to kind of transition to how I first came in contact with your content, which was when you were talking to Bishop Barron, I think last August, right? Yeah, August. And one of the things that has been, this rings true to my own experience was like, I became Catholic, say in the mid to late nineties, started hanging out with Catholic in Catholic circles sometime around then. And it wasn't unusual for me. Simple house was founded in 2003. So we're almost 20 years old. Um, I would be getting, I would sit down at tables at the diocese, at a seminary or anywhere, and merely believing in the catechism, even in a Catholic church setting, was considered to be fairly conservative. Oh, yeah. 
Right. All right. Yes. I don't think that's understood right now, you know, and like kind of the like what I think of as like the Nancy Pelosi Biden style of Catholicism um, was 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 very strong and maybe even like winning the day. It felt like at any given moment. Yes, you know? it was. It, it was. was right. Yeah. I remember I was brought into the Diocese of Washington a long time ago and um we were told that we would get funding from the diocese if we became more like this organization called Acorn. And within two years, it was the very first like uh, Project Veritas thing where they showed Acorn trying to fund a brothel. And uh, yeah. the Catholic Church had been giving money to them. And we, you know, <laughs> I was yeah. like, thank God we didn't oh, take yeah. that advice and become more like Acorn, you know. But yeah. So, well, yeah. And Go now ahead. today, 20 years later, and I think partly because of the sex abuse scandal, um, that's not the feel anymore when I go down to the diocese. It's almost like, do you believe in more than the catechism? You know? Yeah. Um, and I also felt like back 20 years ago that anyone who believed in the catechism was like a fellow traveler, um, even to the extent that like you were glad to have the legionaries around or something like that, where, where yeah. they, they were kind of an unhealthy form of orthodoxy. Um, but they were like an ally when you felt like there were no allies and now it's, it's reversed. It feels like, do you, do you, does that ring true or what's your comment oh, on that? God, once again, do you have three hours? Right. Cause now we're, 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 we're touching about, you know, the whole post conciliar church. And to a lot of people, Vatican II is just way in the rear view mirror, distant news, who cares? And we do need to care because that's, that's the seminal event of the modern church. And, and it still frames what's going on in the church. So as much as we'd like to ignore Vatican II, we simply can't. We can't. It's the elephant in the living room. Now, I lived through the silly season, as George Weigel called it, in the late 60s and into the 70s. And, I mean, long story short, I mean, it's a caricature, but it's true. After the council, two basic schools of thought emerged. Uh, one school of thought said the council can be largely ignored because what the council was preeminently was simply an event. This is sort of the Bologna school, as it's so-called, of, of interpretation. The council was more important for what it, what it started, that it was a catalytic event that set in motion a process of change, a process of accommodation to the modern world. And, and so it doesn't matter what the council actually said, because a lot of what it said was still stuck in the past. And it had to say those things in order to please the conservatives. But in reality, the council was this dynamic event pushing us forward. So we need to keep it moving. This is the so-called spirit of Vatican II, which is, I think, a bit of a misnomer that uh, people use that term, but in reality, what it is, is Vatican II viewed as a progressive unfolding of a process. And that's why progressive Catholics feel utterly justified in calling themselves Catholics. Go ahead. I think what's funny about that interpretation of the council is that counts, that interpretation is shared by the most progressive and the most traditional. Exactly. <laughs> and, 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 We'll, we'll, we'll get we'll get to that in a second. Okay. Okay. And I, I define myself as trad adjacent. I get that from my friend Kale, Kale Zeldin. I am a form of a traditionalist, but I have huge problems with the rad trads, as they're called. But oh, anyway, that after the council, you get this progressive narrative that council is an event moving us forward. That played beautifully into the mass, the secular mass media of the Western world, because that's the message they wanted to hear. Aha. Okay. So the Catholic church is now simply going to be part of this ongoing unfolding of modern liberal culture. Uh, and, and they won the day as Ratzinger himself, no Pope Benedict, you know, there was the council and there was the council in the media and the media council sort of won. And it, it is a, an interpretation of rupture that the council as an event broke with the past and is now it's like a second reformation unleashing this revolution and anything goes, which then accounts for all, all the craziness that unfolded in the church. And you wonder what were they thinking? Well, they're thinking was we're experimenting. We're, we're, we're exploring and it's exciting. You know, <laughs> they were like adolescents who, you know, first went off to college for the first time and suddenly booze it up <laughs> because mom and dad aren't around and I can booze it up. And so this was the church boozing it up, as I like to say. Uh, and and then there was the, there were those who were saying, oh, wait a minute, this is not this is not Catholicism. And the council did not rupture with the past. Did it change some things? Yes. Did it reverse certain teachings of the past? Yes. And as Ratzinger notes, Ratzinger doesn't 
call it a total continuity with the past. Ratzinger said the council was a council of reform. And in any reform, there are going to be little micro ruptures with the past where things have gotten distorted and need correcting. But those micro ruptures are in the service of a greater continuity with the broader and deeper tradition. That's where I fall into uh, Ratzinger started the journal Communio, and we're called Communio Theologians with Balthazar de Lubach and others. And and this is then the second interpretive element uh, after the council, and it did not win the day, even though John Paul II and Pope Benedict were both strong proponents of this vision of the council. And, and now Pope Francis seems to be wanting to resurrect, at least in part, some of that progressive sort of let's just move this, let's move the needle in this direction again. And you find a lot then of the progressives coming back out of the woodwork and saying, yes, I don't know that Pope Francis agrees with a lot of what's being said in his name, um, but neither does he, in a sense, go against a lot of things that are being said in his name. So Pope Francis to me is just an enigma. I'm not opposed to him. I find that the progressives in the church to me, feel like a non-entity at this point. Um, Meaning like they felt like such a powerful force 20 years ago. And today I feel like they're just not where the energy is and they're not, I don't feel them as much of a threat anymore. That's true. This is a great observation, such a great observation, because I'm often criticized by uh, traditionalists uh, with regard to my blog is that I go after traditionalists more on my blog than I do the progressives. And what they point out to me is, hey, look, the progressives are still in charge of Catholic higher education, chancery offices, even elements of the Vatican, maybe even Pope Francis himself, who knows? And and so why don't you see that the that the, the great danger is the progressives? But I share your point of view. Progressive Catholicism is a dead end. And I don't care how many progressive Catholics there are that are out there in positions of authority and power. I believe that it will eventually burn itself out because it's 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 non-sustainable. I mean, going back to what you said earlier, I mean, when I was a young man, if I if you believed in the catechism, you were thought to be a reactionary troglodyte from hell because you oh, my, my God, you're stuck in. You're stuck in catechism, Catholicism, and we're moving this forward. But I knew even as a young man, that's a dead end. That's a dead. That's not Catholicism. Well, and so I the think, real the real mojo is with the traditionalists, which is why I engage them. I And I think that the progressive, it's just kind of a false thing because it, it was um, when the church was rich, when there was a lot to be had by, you know, gaining position in it. Um, the progressives were strong. And now that the church is less and less popular and more and more a minority, there's less of a reason to remain Catholic unless you really believe, you know? And what I find is that even if you have a, a student center at some university pumping out progressive Catholics, they're just not Catholics five years later. So they're not having lasting impact in my mind. Yeah, it doesn't. They don't seem to sustain themselves, which is why, uh, I think precisely because progressives still sort of control the agenda in many ways in higher education. I'm from the academic world, and I can tell you they still dominate Catholic higher education. The fact is, this is why we're seeing diminishing numbers of of Catholics. I was just talking to a priest friend of mine from the diocese of, uh, well, I won't say the diocese. I don't want him to be identified, but a diocese in the northeastern United States. And what he said is, if you look at the statistics in our diocese, baptisms, marriages, all of these things are just way, way, way down. Uh, and, and and therefore, what you see is that kind of progressive Catholicism is in some ways dying out. And the only ones that are going to be left are the people that take their faith seriously. Now, I want to rush in and say something, which is this. One of the things that the sex abuse crisis taught us was that sort of neocon Catholicism, uh, sort of sort of standard conservative catechism Catholicism is also in many ways deficient. So long as what you did was, oh, I believe all the, what the catechism teaches and I adhere to church teaching, but then I'm going to live my life largely as a sort of suburban secular. Uh, it, it's not going to move the needle either. And what we see from the sex abuse cry, I, I bought into the theory long ago, like so many of us or the, Orthodox Catholics did, that the sex abuse crisis was caused by liberals, liberal priests who didn't believe in the sexual teachings of the church, sowing their wild oats, 
uh, not able to keep their zippers up because they just didn't believe that it was necessary. Uh, but that conservative Catholicism was going to save the day. Those priests were going to be faithful to their vows. Not. Not. Yeah. In fact, you see many, many, many sex abuse cases in the most right wing radical right. elements in Catholicism. And it gives the lie to this idea that if that all you need to do is make sure you believe in the catechism and all is going to be well. Dorothy Day and Peter Moore knew this 80, 90 years ago, that it's right. got to go deeper than that. Yeah. And and we wouldn't have had the great falling away after Vatican II had merely like the Baltimore catechism type approach been so successful. Great point. And yeah. this brings us to the rad trads. OK, and I say this to them all the time in their romanticization of the pre-Vatican II church. Look at the numbers. Oh, mass attendance, marriages, baptisms, vocations, all parishes being built. And that was all healthy. And then the council came along and ruined everything. Well, the bottom fell, trust me, I lived through it. The bottom fell out of that form of Catholicism overnight, overnight. You know what it reminds me of is, and this, this uh, reference doesn't play well with people who are in their 20s, but like, do you know there's the old Protestant song, Give Me Some of That Old Time Religion? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, we should play that at the end of this podcast. But that there's a little bit of that in the new Catholic way. It's like this, like, just give me some of that old time religion and it'll be okay, you know? Give me some of that old time Latin religion. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, if, now, if everything was in Latin again and we had the forbidden index of books and we all sort of adhered to the Baltimore Catechism, all would be well again. But that whole culture bottomed out and fell through. I'm going to say one thing before you go on. This, this insight that there was a, a deep rot deep within the preconciliar church, okay, is not simply mine or, or post-Vatican II thinkers like me. You go all the way back, all the way back to the early to mid-20th century, and you find Catholic intellectuals as different as the literary author Georges Benanos, Diary of a Country Priest, uh, theologians like Romano Guardini, uh, um, Louis Bouillet, Joseph Ratzinger, Balthazar, De Lubac, uh, philosophers like uh, Gilson and Maritain, uh, other literary figures like Francois Mauriac. What you see is them all ringing the alarm bell, Paul Claudel, others uh, ringing the alarm bell saying, holy cow, the church is hollowed out from within. Joseph Ratzinger, the very first article he ever published was in 1958 in a German, a very influential German journal called Hochland. And in the title of the article was The New Paganism in the Church. And his whole point was the church has, be, uh, you could, oh, there's some killer quotes. I mean, he says the church has become a church of pagans. The church is not just a church of former pagans who have now become Catholic. The church has become pagan in its membership. Paganism has hollowed out. This is in 1958. Joseph Ratzinger pointing this I, out. I feel like, um, John Henry Newman kind of pointed the way on that, meaning oh, like he kind yes. of was like, hey, I converted for these reasons. I didn't convert because I read, you know, the 19th century theologians, you know. Um, yes. Anyway. He, read, I, he went back and read the church fathers and Newman is big on this. Newman saw the handwriting in the wall already in the 1830s when he was still an Anglican. He saw that modern culture's nullification of God was eventually going to seep into the church and destroy it. Now, um, one of the things that this is my take, and I, I want to think you see if you share it, that communio group that was forming in this like post Vatican II silly period and kind of creating yeah, yeah. to me, that was like a dynamic orthodoxy, like a very healthy, dynamic group. And yeah. at that point, it was a very conservative group. And in today's world at this moment, it feels like a very liberal group, even though it's been I don't think they've changed. They it's like the setting has changed around them. Yeah, the traditionalists hate them uh, <laughs> because they, they, they view them as just modernists, modernists. So you're, you're trad adjacent. Are you also, but I also get a feeling you're part of this communio group. Oh, I am a thorough, I mean, I did my doctoral dissertation on Hans Urs von Balthasar. Uh, I, I've written articles, five, six, I think, for communio. I'm really close friends with all of the people who are editors down there in Washington, D.C., at the John Paul II Institute, guys like David Schindler, Mike Hanby, Nick Healy, uh, Crawford, Dave Crawford, Margaret McCarthy, these people. Yeah, um, I think th they still represent the best theology that is out there, and they haven't changed. But now 
the traditionalists think they're part of the problem because the communio theologians support the Second Vatican Council and its reforms. Look, in a lot of ways, the council, as I like to say, what was the conciliar project? The conciliar project wasn't progressive. It wasn't what the progressives say it is, nor was it what the traditionalists say it was, because the trads say the same thing, uh, the council, just this event that meant uh, liberalism. The fact is, the council fathers understood, as I said, there was a deep rot within the church, and they understood that the church had to rise up to the challenge that the modern world represented. It could no longer be a sort of fortress Catholicism. We have our truths and to hell with all of you. And now let's, let's circle the wagons, build great walls against the culture, and let's, let's just, let's just uh, ride this thing out, shall we? And the Council Fathers knew that's a recipe for disaster because the people in the pews are still being formed by the culture. They're not behind the walls of the fortress. All right. They're, they're not living in monasteries. You can shut off. You can shut off your TV. You can't shut off your culture. And, and the fathers knew that. So what they saw was this, a rejuvenation of the church's inner life. That's why they called it a pastoral council. The rejuvenation of the church's inner life through a, re, a redoing of the church's theology. And what, what the, in a sense, the council represented was a re, what I call a reinterrogation of the entirety of the Catholic tradition in order to represent it in all of its truth and fullness, but in a sort of modern language, uh, shorn of some of the neo-scholastic sort of turgid, jargonistic sort of deductive kinds of dry theology that, that everybody had been exposed to up to that point. And that reinterrogation of the tradition sought a kind of Christological reduction. In other words, let's reframe all the doctrines of the church in the light of Christ. Christ crucified and risen. And let's represent those doctrines as extrapolations of the Christ event, of the Paschal mystery, of everything that Christ represents and the sacraments and otherwise. And communio represents, once again, that Christocentrism. And, and that's why that project is the only possible project that can, in a sense, properly retrieve the Second Vatican Council. Progressives won't. Neither will the traditionalists, because all the traditionalists want to do is to say, to heck with the council. Let's go back to Gary Lagrange. Let's go back to the neo-scholastics. Let's forget all this communio theology because they're just modernists. Why do they think communio theologians, race source model theologians are modernists? Because they take Communio theologians take seriously the modern philosophical sort of introduction into, into our thought frame of the importance of history and subjectivity. It goes all the way back to Maurice Blondel, that, that we need to consider the fact that we have doctrines which are true objectively, fine, but those doctrines have to be received and appropriated by beings that live in history and in time and have a certain subjectivity that theology has to take into consideration the importance of subjectivity, the importance of appropriation. Now, the progressives take that and run with it in a historicizing way. Well, that's why dogmas can change. That's why everything can change because historical circumstances change. Whereas the communio theologians say, no, 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 no. We have to take into account historical change and human subjectivity, but we also need to see the thread of continuity, the thread of continuity. Let, I would like to rephrase the Ressourcement movement in a way and see if you agree with this way of thinking about it. I feel like there was a weird bottleneck in theology with Tom Aquinas. And, and what I mean by a bottleneck was we had all yeah. these church fathers, we had all this scripture, we had all this Catholic thinking. And then Thomas, as a great genius, takes many parts of that and kind of re, uh, does his own thing with it, which is all true and great. But then it's like when we get post Thomas, we start instead of going back to all the sources that he went to, we go back to Thomas. Right? Yeah, yeah. And that the Vatican II is like a reopening of the sources Thomas used. In a sense, it's more Thomistic because it's like Thomas would have never said, don't go to the fathers of the church and only use me. You know? Well, yeah, that's, that's a good point. All right. And, and the, the thing is, for example, um, Resourcement theology is not anti St. Thomas. Right. I would say Resourcement th theology, to a great extent, is a kind of form of Thomistic thinking. Uh, Hans Urs von Balthasar, for example, quotes Thomas Aquinas more than any other, any other author. And, and so the idea that these guys are anti Thomas, de Lubach, Henry de Lubach, sort of the founder of the Resourcement school in many ways, spent his entire career exegeting St. Thomas's view on nature and grace. I mean, that was the big controversy of that time. 
All right. So, yeah, they all pay. I like your phrase that there was a sort of Thomistic bottleneck in a way that Thomas would not would not have liked. I mean, as if you remember, Thomas ha had to be escorted, if you will, by guards as he went to the University of Paris because everybody was opposed to his introduction of Aristotle I into his thinking. Well, this is what really uh, is interesting to me right now, because as there's this movement towards tradition and Western tradition in particular, there's this way of reading it where they're just for tradition. And it's like everything you're reading was so transgressive in its own day. You know, like, like, like to only, the only way to understand these great classical Western works is to understand them as very radical. <laughs> You know, I like it traditional. I like it at the fact you ever, you ever see like these television evangelists, these great big mega church preachers. Right. They, they, they give their they, they give their like hour long spiels on you know on this that and the other thing, and they're waving a Bible in the air. They got that Bible they're waving in the air, and yet they rarely quote it. Uh, to them, the the Bible waving is a kind of talisman that they're just sort of waving in the air. The Bible, the Bible, and yet nothing that they're saying is really all that biblical. It's more sort of warmed over Republican politics. So the fact is, I when I encounter a lot of trads, not the sort of bookish ones that you know write books sure. on things, but the sort of average street trad that's always on Facebook trashing me because of my support of Robert Barron and Balthazar and these people, and they're saying Aquinas, Aquinas. They remind me of those mega church evangelists. They'll wave the summa in the air, but I I wager that none of them have actually really read it and understood it. So I want to move on to a new topic on this. Um, I'm pretty familiar with the Kansas City area and with the Washington, D.C. area. And in each area, I see a rise of something I call Mecca parishes, where it's like a lot of very well theologically formed people start gathering at one parish, you know? Right. And what I right. think almost like if I was to say what I thought the old system was, the old system would have been that they all stayed at different parishes and they were the RCIA teachers and they were the, you know, kind of top 10% of theologically educated people at their parish, but instead they're traveling further to this parish with a lot more people like themselves, right? Yeah. Which might be over enriching one parish and impoverishing other parishes in the diocese. It also, there's something about it to me that doesn't resonate with the poor and resonate with this idea that like the church is for everyone. And, you know, um, do you have any, yeah. what, what do you have any thoughts on this? Well, that's an interesting question because, and I think there's great merit in what you have to say, but full disclosure, you know, I don't want to be hypocrite here. I mean, I no longer attend my territorial parish, uh, even though I'm a cradle Catholic and my wife as well, we attend an ordinariate parish uh, here in Scranton. In fact, we, where I'm broadcasting from it right now is not our farm. It's a second really crappy house, row house in a poor neighborhood of Scranton uh, that we bought simply to be two blocks away from this church. My, my wife runs the homeschooling cooperative at this church, and there must be seven or eight theology PhDs in this parish, and it's a small parish. Uh, and, and so the phenomenon that you describe is very real, and, you know, it's, it's on my conscience as well. But the, the fact is there's, and, and so, yeah, in some ways that's not a good thing. You know, it's an embarrassment of riches in this ordinary parish. But it's also a testimony of the fact if you build it, they will come. Why were all of these intellectual sorts attracted to this ordinary parish? It's because in a lot of ways it was doing things right. And so there, there was a sense of you build something strong and then you migrate out from there. Uh, if, we're, if we're all diffused through all various territorial parishes, a little pinprick of light here, a little pinprick of light there, your energies can be dissipated. I, I wonder if the strong thing, though, should be like a um, trans parish group, like an Opus Dei or a uh, sure. Knights of Columbus or a, or like some group where you're getting this like association with maybe like highly intellectual people. But then at the same time, you're with the common, you know, when you're real neighborhood in a sense, you know, on Sunday. Well, you know, the problem is this, is that, you know, and I know this from talking to my friend who's a, who's a traditionalist, Peter Kwasniewski. Uh, you might be familiar with Peter's writings on the traditional Latin mass. Peter's a big Latin mass guy. He's a trad, uh, and yet uh, we're friends. Uh, and he, for a long time, for example, was a big proponent of the reform of the reform of the Novus Ordo liturgy. He was involved in the sort of new liturgical movement and so on. But what he said to me was, Larry, 
I migrated finally to simply being an advocate for the traditional Latin mass because I got tired of banging my head against a wall. I got tired of meeting resistance after resistance after resistance in whatever territorial parish I found myself in to the kinds of things that I thought, you know, would be conducive to, to better liturgy and better catechesis in the parish. And this, I, I don't want to extrapolate too much from Peter's experience, but I think it's true of so many of us that we went into these territory, these large suburban territories parishes and we we you know sought to do our thing there and only to meet with resistance from the pastor resistance from all kinds of parishioners and and you might say well stay and fight that's the cross that's that's the crucifixion of your existence you know and yet human nature being human nature it wears you down after a while and and, and you say you know what well, i don't know if this is working that my problem with this inherently is that it's like an over focus on liturgy meaning like you know well, the priest what, yeah the priest in the Old Testament is the temple worker, right? If there's one part of society that the priest is in charge of, it's the temple, right? And yeah. the the realm of the laity is the army, the politics, the education system, the social welfare system. I mean, it's like it's like much vaster than the temple, right? And yet we have all the laity who want to fight the fight at the temple. They like they want to do the one job that's kind of like not properly theirs, like run the liturgy. And I feel like so much of the tension in the, pro like, like a lot of the goodness that comes out of these local parishes is rubbing elbows with people with different worldviews who are like, they're trying to figure oh, out how they're going to run the food pantry. Yeah. You know? And that's why I said, I don't necessarily want to extrapolate from Peter's experience okay. to, to, to everything else, because he was focused on the liturgy. And so your caveat is spot on because the the parish isn't just its liturgy liturgy is central but it's not the only thing i that same priest friend who was telling me up in, in his little new england diocese about you know the diminishment of numbers i mean in his parish he's built a, a homeless shelter okay and uh you know a, a soup kitchen and a homeless shelter right next to the parish and man oh man oh man did he meet resistance and yet he stuck to his guns and and now the homeless shelter is almost completed and they they have coffee hour for the homeless and so on and it's really changed the dynamic of the entire parish and thank god the people that agreed with him stayed and didn't migrate off into some super super pure parish or something so yeah what you're saying is absolutely true and it has to be taken into consideration uh that in some ways you need to stand where you are and fight uh and and work for all of those things that are most properly the role of the lady to work for. Now, in, in the defense of those of us who have migrated to non-territorial parishes, the vast majority of Catholics stay in their parish. Uh, I think even the vast majority of, of, you know, devout, orthodox, intellectual Catholics with PhDs pretty much stay in their territorial parish. If for no other reason, it's not fun to try, drive two hours on a Sunday to get to, get to your preferred parish. Uh, which is why we bought this little house because yeah, yeah. the because the ordinary at parish is an hour away from our farm and we kind of got tired of the drive. Um, but anyway, that's that's my thoughts on that. It's not ideal, and I it would be great if all territorial parishes were able to retain the talent that is there, um, and that's the reason why territorial parishes are territorial, and and why it is that the church tells us that we should attend our territory. So I'm not telling people abandon your territorial parish and run off to the ordinary as I did, but that is the choice we made for better or for worse. So I have a uh, friend, a good friend, who's a, a big follower of yours, and he sent me a question for you. Sure. He says that you use the term discalced laity quite a bit, and he wants to know what you mean by that and how that's just how, what, what special thing you're trying to say different than the universal call to holiness? Well, oh, that's, a, that's a great question. So thank you to whoever asked it. Um, as um, those of uh, those of your listeners who don't know, I mean, in the history of the church, whenever uh, religious orders in particular, uh, they, they would start with a certain charism started by a saint usually, and they would be great guns for a while. And then the way of the world would set in, lassitude would set in, 
sort of mediocrity would set in. And so uh, somebody would rise up in the order to start a sort of breakaway movement from, and, and we're going to be more rigorous. And so they would become the discalced Carmelites or whatever. Discalced means you don't wear shoes. So in other words, extreme asceticism, those others wear shoes. We don't wear shoes. That's how strong we are. Uh, and so I thought, well, that's a great metaphor for what I'm looking for with regard to the universal call to holiness, that what we, what we need is in a sense more than just the universal call to holiness. So your questioner is very astute here. What we need is, a, is because a generic universal call to holiness can be once again co-opted by a kind of pietism. A kind of superficial, like, well, okay, well, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna go to daily mass instead of such a Sunday mass and pray more rosaries. That's all great. I'm, I'm not making fun of that. Well, I guess I'm a little bit, but I'm making fun of a mentality, okay, a certain pietism that says, as long as I accumulate pious practices, I'm engaged in the universal call to holiness. When in fact, what it really should involve is a complete conversion of the heart a complete change, a complete metanoia, a turning away from the world so that I want to live a more radically Christocentric life. So I, I use the word discouse to simply mean I'm going to try and differentiate myself in some form and fashion as somebody who's living this more radically uh, than what I'm actually commanded to do by the church. I've got a question about academia that I want to hear your response to. So um, you were a professor. I've never actually taken a class in theology. Um, well, geez, you wouldn't know. You're very conversant. Thank you. Uh, I am dealing with crop after crop of uh, young 20-somethings, right? They're, they're usually right after college. We'll get a new wave of six to eight, you know, new missionaries. And I, I have to talk to them all the time about what they want to do next and things like this. And um, one of the big problems I see in academia as a whole is an overproduction of PhDs. Oh, and yes. It, yes. And it has something to do with it's a very selfish thing, I think. I think it's like um, it's what you're they're They're feeding these young people to like the academic industrial complex. Right. And yes. unfortunately, I'm seeing that also a little bit in Catholic academia where like I'll meet, you know, these young 20 somethings and what they want is they want to know God better. They want to in a sense work for God or and therefore they see the logical path ahead of them after Simple House or even before Simple House is go get a theology graduate degree. Right? Yes. And what I'm seeing is when I actually meet the people who go the distance, you know, there's no job for them except maybe in high school level right? With a PhD. Um, they're going to have a very difficult time as a family, you know, just financial stress is a very real problem in marriage, you know? And when you see what they actually wrote on, it's like some, you know, thing, some work that, I mean, I'm like, there's always like academics that will reinvent a field and never discourage one of them from going to do it. But, um, there's a lot of academic. There's a lot of PhDs minted that are writing things that might become footnotes in someone else's paper. Oh, right. Man. And I just yeah. like, what to do about this? Like, is this a big problem in your mind? I'm like, I'm telling everyone to not go go, go stay theology in grad school. Oh no, this is this is a huge problem. As it came out in my interview on my blog with the the theologian Lewis Ayers, who's who's in the UK. He's a great guy. You should go to my blog and watch my interview with Lewis Ayers. He's the funniest guy in the face of the earth and a brilliant guy. But anyway, this is absolutely true. There's too many PhDs. And the reason why there's too many PhDs is because the schools that have PhD programs want to keep the mill churning. They, 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 want, they want to have a PhD program, but you can't have a PhD program without students. And in order to have students, you need to grant a lot of PhDs. And then they go out there and where are the jobs? There simply are no jobs. I, I counsel anybody that I know this in this day and age if you if you want to major in theology as an undergraduate fine but you should double major in something else uh, and if you want to go on and get a master's online in theology for your own personal enrichment fine so you can run an rcia program or run the catechism classes in your in your parish fine i'm not opposed to a theologically educated laity but this notion that we are churning out all of these phds and then in order to get a job, and then even if they get a job to get tenure, they have to publish, publish, publish. So I would add to what you're saying. There's not only too many PhDs, there's too many theology articles out 
There are too many theology books out there. It's just a blizzard of all of these publications of varying quality uh, that, that I think are completely unnecessary. Most people don't even read them. I always tell people, I mean, I wrote a, a, a book that took me five years to write scholarly book on science and religion called the God of covenant and creation, scientific naturalism, and it's challenge to the faith. It's very, very metaphysical communio Germanic gobbledygook. And I think it was read by all of 10 people, you know, it was well re reviewed cost like 80 bucks, which meant mainly libraries had it. And okay. So I wrote my little book. And I published scholarly articles in Communio and other places, and some people read it. And yet I have never been more influential as a theologian in my entire life since I quit doing all that and started blogging. I started to blog as a lark, just thinking as an outlet, something to do with my spare time just to get my juices flowing. And also for my own spiritual enrichment, because nothing in a sense helps you grow in your own spiritual life. It's a kind of online journaling where you're sort of thinking yourself through a problem and writing yourself through a problem. And I was shocked when it went viral. I was shocked when my blog just suddenly exploded all over and I end up on Bishop Barron's show and so forth, which only goes, I always tell people who was more influential in the history of the 20th century in terms of theology, Carl Rahner or C.S. Lewis? Oh, or I was going to bring that up. That's great. You know, yeah. uh, Lewis, Lewis, obviously, obviously. And that's not to say there's no place. Obviously, I'm glad Carl Rahner existed, Balthazar existed, Ratzinger, but that sort of makes our point to an extent. The reason why those guys stand out is because they're the true the true giants. Well, there's and, another and everybody reason. Everybody else though. is their epigones. Everybody else is their expositor and their interpreter. I so Lewis, I love, and I love that he used to be made fun of as not a real theologian. Yet Wrong. the yet the Pope will like quote Lewis on purgatory as like an authority when he's writing a fiction work. We have a non-Catholic writing fiction who's quoted as a theological authority, which is wild. Hey, look, uh, uh, Hans Urs von Balthasar considered C.S. Lewis so important that he had several of his books translated into German through Balthasar's publishing house. Uh, there are obviously two schools of thought with Lewis. One is, oh, he's just a silly popularizer and he's got some squishy theological ideas. But I tell you what, as a theologian, when you read, a, when you read Lewis, what you see lurking behind every word that Lewis writes is a vast erudition. You understand, oh, that's Plato. Oh, that's Aristotle. Oh, that's Aquinas. And or just see... relationship with God. He's just seemed to know God. Yeah. And, and one of the things about Lewis, though, that I see missing now when I meet people who study theology is Lewis seemed to be oriented towards the world he lived in, meaning like he seemed to be speaking into that world with like mere Christianity and things. Yeah. Um, and in a way, like now, I feel like a theologian needs to speak into the nihilism and somehow show God as beautiful, show God as a life raft, show God as like exciting meaning that is offered, you know, to people. Yes. Instead of, you know, entering a Vatican II debate. Oh, absolutely. Anyway, I'm just like, I just feel like that's where the new, like, I feel like your role is kind of as a pastor to Catholics in a sense, like you're helping us from within the church direction but we need these like evangelist theologians, kind of like Lewis and Chesterton. Yeah, we do. And, and so this would be my point. I, 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 I think that I, I, you know, I obviously have no problem with, with, with there being theology departments and universities and so forth. But one of my deepest regrets as I look back on my career is that I wasted too much of my time on high end scholarship and not enough of my time on doing what you just described. Um, I was a very, to toot my own horn a little bit, but there's a point to it. I was a very popular teacher. I was a very good teacher because I was, I did exactly what you're taught. I called people out of their nihilism. I flipped their cultural script. I challenged them. I provoked them and so on. I wish I had written as I had taught, <laughs> you know, right. and, 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 but you know, I, my life is what it was, but I agree with you completely. We need more Lewis's, more Chesterton's out there. Uh, and fewer and fewer of the theologian wannabes. Now, there's a lot of good, you know, there's a lot of good second tier theologians out there writing decent theology and so on. I don't want to sound anti-intellectual or anti-academic, but but there is a great need for what you described. And I don't think the Catholic academic world is paying enough attention to it. That's great. Um, Dr. Larry Chap, that's kind of all the questions I had for you today. Is, well, there anything, is there anything you want to leave everybody with? 
just no, I, I, I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, go to my blog, GaudiMetsBest22.com. And, uh, you know, everybody just sort of keep the faith, keep on chugging. Don't be discouraged. Don't, don't get despondent. There's a lot of gloom and doom in the church these days and a lot of doomsayers. Um, but there's also a lot of green sap in the church. So don't lose the faith. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.